Well, we wish everyone a very pleasant good morning as we have come together to open our hearts and our lips to offer our praise unto our God and our Heavenly Father. Appreciate the songs that our brother Matthew has led us in this morning to think about our holy God and to think about we as His children can be in His presence now as we live from day to day, but certainly we are longing for the time when we can be in His presence forever. And we can join with those who have gone before us, those who may have uh, suffered because of their faith in Jesus Christ, yes, those who have even died for their faith in Jesus Christ. And we can be together with all the saints, with all the redeemed of all the ages, and we can glorify and honor our great God. Last Sunday, we began part one of a two-part sermon in thinking about our series this year on being more like Jesus. And we began last week's sermon by stating that God is a God of emotion, that God is an emotional being. And because, as the Bible tells us very early on in the book of Genesis chapter 1 at verse 26, that we as people have been made in His image, we too are emotional beings. We are people that have emotions just as God does. However, like many other things, emotions have the potential for both good and bad. They can either be a blessing or a curse to us personally, or they can be a blessing or a curse to those that we know that are in our life. And that all depends, of course, upon how we express our emotions and when we express our emotions and even why we express the emotions that we do from one occasion to another. Today I want us to continue to look to Jesus, our great example, to see what moved him to emotion, to see how he expressed emotion, and to see how Jesus perfectly expressed emotions in all different situations in his earthly life so that we can become more like Jesus in our emotions as well. So we talked last week about Jesus seeing people in all kinds of stressful situations. We talked about Jesus seeing people, first of all, in physical distress, people that were dealing with all kinds of physical hurts and uh, ailments and maladies, and Jesus often took the time to notice those people out of a large crowd and to show love and to show grace and to show compassion for those individuals and not to pass them by or to say, I'm too busy for you or you don't count but to stop and to do something for those individuals. And then we thought, secondly, connected to that, that Jesus certainly, in keeping with his mission of coming to seek and to save that which was lost, he saw lots of people that were in spiritual distress, people that were like sheep without a shepherd. And he showed love and he showed grace and he showed compassion toward those folks because he of all people to ever walk the earth knew what that would mean for them if they stayed in that state, if they continued to stay lost, where, where that would lead them not only in this earthly life, but where that would lead them eternally. And so he did everything that he could to bring them out of that particular state. This morning, again, we want to continue to think about Jesus and some things that moved him to emotion. And once again, as we begin our lesson this morning, it was people. But I want to suggest to you, first of all, in this lesson, that People who rejected his father's will moved Jesus Christ to emotion. I'm sure none of you remember all the way back to January, but the very first lesson in this series of being more like Jesus was taken from Luke chapter 2 when Jesus was a young boy about the age of 12. And you remember what Luke tells us there at the end of that chapter about his parents, uh, Joseph and Mary, and Jesus going to the city of Jerusalem as they would often do. And uh, leaving Jesus, uh, not realizing that Jesus was being left behind as they traveled in the caravan to go back home. And finding that out a few days later and being concerned about where Jesus was and being frantic, as you can imagine, parents being that their boy was somewhere in Jerusalem, but they didn't know where and they didn't know what he was doing. And the conversation when he, they found him, he said, Do you not know that I have to be about my father's business or in my father's house and the point of that whole sermon in that text was Jesus came to do his Father's will. He knew that was his purpose here upon earth. He knew that was his mission. 
And so obviously Jesus came to earth to do His Father's will. This was His mission, His reason for coming. And so those who stood opposed to doing His Father's will, those who maybe heard what His Father's will for their life was, and they chose to just reject that message, it was people like that that moved Jesus to emotion and action. So what kind of emotions did Jesus express toward these kind of folks? I want us to look at just a a few passages in the Gospels this morning. First of all, from the Gospel of Mark. If you have your Bible, to open there to Mark chapter 3, and let's begin reading at verse 1, Mark 3 at verse 1. Mark says that he, Jesus, entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. They, talking about the Pharisees, they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and come forward. And he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. Here is Jesus as you read through the Gospels, you often find from time to time that he is in a synagogue. He was going to a place where he knew that the Jews would be. He was going to a place where he knew at least this audience would know something about God. They would know something about God's Word. They were supposed to be well studied or well versed in the old scriptures, the Old Testament as we would call it. But he is once again in a synagogue as Mark chapter 3 opens. And he's not only in a synagogue, but Mark tells us he's in a synagogue on the Sabbath day. And as you read through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find that there are occasions when Jesus is doing things or saying things. He's having a conversation or an exchange with his opponents on the Sabbath. And so while he is here in a synagogue on the Sabbath day, Jesus used this withered man's hand, I think, to try to reach the Pharisees, his opposition with truth about who he really is, about his true identity, that he is the Son of Man, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah that God has sent. He is Emmanuel, as we've already sung about this morning, God with us. But not only to give them the truth about who he truly is, but also to try to teach them on this occasion the true intent of the Sabbath day laws that his Father had given them. We're not going to go back this morning and take the time to read what the Old Testament, the law of Moses, said about the Sabbath day. But I believe it's very clear, it's very plain, it seems to be very simple. If you think back to the Ten Commandments there in Exodus chapter 20, that they as God's people were to observe the Sabbath day, they were to keep it holy. It was to be a day of rest for them. But as you know, if you know anything about the Pharisees, they had taken what God had said about the Sabbath day. They had added on all of their traditions, all of their rules and commandments to that, and they had kind of built a hedge around that particular law as they did around a lot of other laws that God had given. And I believe Jesus was trying to show the Pharisees on this occasion what was the true intent of the Sabbath day. It was for God's people to rest. But Jesus asked the question of them there at verse 4, Is it lawful to do good? Or to do harm on the Sabbath day? Is it lawful to save a life or is it only lawful to kill a life? He he has pointedly asked them what God's true intent of these laws really was. And of course, as they often did, they refused to answer Jesus because I think if they were honest with themselves, the answer that they gave would show that they were being dishonest people. And so Jesus noticed, Mark says to us here at verse 5, that he looked around at them, not this particular man that had the withered hand, but he's looking at his adversaries, he's looking at his opponents, he's looking at people who are rejecting God's will for their life. And he looked at them, Mark says, with anger. He looked at them with a grieved heart. That Their hardness of heart really affected Jesus Christ. Because he was trying to soften their hearts, as he was trying to soften the hearts of everyone, I believe, that he talked to. But their hard, stubborn, rebellious hearts resulted in them rejecting the Father's will for their lives. It moved Jesus to a righteous anger, I believe. It moved him to true grief for these people in the sad spiritual state that they were in. Yes, Jesus got angry. Sometimes we don't think about Jesus maybe getting angry. And having said that Jesus got angry, that he 
was angry on this occasion doesn't mean that here was in Jesus someone who was out of control. Because Jesus, I believe, was always in control of himself. He was always a humble person, but at the same time, I think this is describing for us what we would call a righteous anger because he knew that these individuals should have known God's law. They should have known better. They should have understood what the Sabbath day law was all about. And yet he was moved to anger and he was moved to grief at their hardness of heart. Staying here in the Gospel of Mark over in chapter 10, I think we find another example of things that move Jesus to emotion. In Mark chapter 10, as he has a conversation with what we often call the rich young ruler. Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 17. Mark says to us, as he was setting out on a journey, talking about Jesus, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus fell to love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But at these words he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. I think we have a different scenario, at least in my mind, between the conversation, the question that is being asked here by this rich young ruler, and the conversation that went on that we just looked at in chapter 3. Uh, unlike most of the Jewish leaders, everything I can read at least in this text and in the parallel text in, in Matthew chapter 19 and in Luke chapter 18, there, there's nothing in any of those texts, at least in my mind, that suggests that this rich young ruler came to Jesus with dishonest motives, that he was coming to try to trap or to trick Jesus, back him into a corner as the religious leaders were often doing. No, I kind of read this as like this young man comes and honestly asks Jesus, what is, I think, a great question? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? You know, I, I know that my earthly life is, on, is only temporary, that it's going to end at one point. How can I obtain eternal life? I think this young man truly desired to know how he could inherit eternal life. And as Jesus looked at him, Mark is the only one, if I remember correctly, among all these three accounts that gives us this information at verse 21. It says, looking at him, Jesus felt a love for this young man. He, he felt a love for this young man. He, he, of course, had the ability as being the Christ to know what was in man, to read people's thoughts, to see their intents, uh, intentions and their motives. And he certainly must have known that this young man was not like the scribes and the Pharisees. He was not coming to try to trap Jesus in some question. He really wanted to know the answer, and so he felt a love for him. But I want you to notice here in Mark chapter 10 that this was something that was more than a feeling. This emotion of love that obviously welled up inside of our Lord, it expressed itself by answering this young man's question and it doesn't seem to be the answer that this young man was looking for. Maybe he was wanting, Je wanting Jesus to tell him, well, you just need to follow a few more commandments. You just need to obey a few more of, the, of God's commands and you will inherit eternal life. But no, Jesus, because of his love for him, he gave him the honest, hard truth. And he said to him, we know what he said at verse 21, there's one thing that you lack. You need to go and sell all that you possess and give the proceeds of that sale to the poor, and then you need to come and follow me. And we read the reaction there in verse 22, because this young man was very wealthy. Because, yes, he had followed a number of God's commands from his youth up. It seems to me that he had kind of forgotten about the first command in the Ten Commandments, to love the Lord your God, that there will be no other gods before him. The greatest command, as a lawyer would ask Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. That this young man, it seems to me, had kept some of God's commands, but he was really in love with himself. <laughs> and he was in love with the stuff that he had obtained. But Jesus' love for him caused him to tell him the truth. Although this rich ruler rejected the Father's will for his life, Jesus again loved him enough to candidly say, 
what he most needed to hear. And so he felt a love for this young man, which caused him to speak in love words of truth. A third example to look at the Gospel of Luke in Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, beginning at verse 34. Toward the very end of this chapter, we have some words of Jesus as he is traveling toward Jerusalem. Notice what he says there about the city, and not just really the city, the place itself, but I think talking about his own people who were living there. In verse 34 of Luke chapter 13, Jesus said these words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate, and I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus, as he was looking at Jerusalem, as he was journeying toward Jerusalem, as Luke tells us in Luke chapter 9, that his face was set toward Jerusalem. He knows that he's got to go to Jerusalem. He knows where this is where he is going to be crucified. And as he thinks about Jerusalem, it, it, it causes him to thoughts to come into his mind. But it also, I, I'm suggesting to you, stirs up some emotions within him. I don't know how you can read these words, and this is an instance where a lot of instances in the Bible, I wish we could hear the particular person speaking these words. I wish we could hear their voice inflections. I wish we could see their facial expressions, but of course we can't do that. But here is Jesus shouting, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. They, they are killing the prophets. They are being obstinate and rebellious people. They are rejecting God's will for their life. And how Jesus often wanted to shelter them and protect them and bring them into his fold just like a hen would gather her chicks under her wings, but they were unwilling. And the comment that Jesus makes here at the end of verse 35, that you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I think we have to turn over to chapter 19 to kind of put these two passages together. Chapter 19 is Jesus is making his way into the city of Jerusalem, what we oftentimes refer to as a triumphal entry. Notice uh, what is said here, beginning at verse 41. Luke says, Luke 19 and verse 41, When he, Jesus, approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day even you the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side until, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. The crowds in just the preceding verses here in this chapter, they're shouting, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. They're laying down the palm branches. They are acknowledging that Jesus is a king. But as he is approaching the city of Jerusalem and the inhabitants itself in that city, as Luke tells us there in verse 41, he begins to weep over those people. As his cru crucifixion is now drawing very close, Jesus is journeying toward the city of Jerusalem as he is descending the Mount of Olives and the city comes into view. Again, Luke says that he wept. One writer says about this word wept that it means that he burst into tears. Yes, Jesus wept. As we saw last week from John chapter 11 there at the tomb of Lazarus, he knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but it moved him, it stirred him to emotion in a good way, you could say, because he knew that he was going to raise him from the dead. But here, from a negative standpoint, he is weeping over this obstinate, rebellious, stubborn people. As their creator, as their savior, he tenderly loved his own people. He wanted so desperately to give them spiritual guidance and protection, just again like that hen gathering her chicks under her wing. But so many of them refused to hear him. And thus, making that choice, they were rejecting God's will for their life. But as we read here in these words in Luke chapter 19, Jesus knows that their refusal to hear God's will, their rejection of God's will for their life would result ultimately in their destruction. I think maybe he has in mind here the city of Jerusalem being destroyed. 
in just a few short years. But even more than that, if they did not repent and return to God, they would be eternally destroyed in hell. We, we live, of course, around people all around us. We live in an environment today that there are just a number of folks around us who refuse to hear the gospel message. That there are people, maybe when we try to teach them about the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, that they make the choice that they're going to reject it once they have heard that particular message. And I'm suggesting to you, if we're going to be more like Jesus when we run across those folks, that that ought to stir within us, yes, some thoughts, that ought to stir within us some words maybe that we can say to them, but at the same time that ought to stir some emotions within us, that ought to stir us to what we call today tough love. Jesus telling this young man, this rich young ruler, the truth. Jesus telling the Pharisees back in Mark chapter 3 the truth about the Sabbath day. In some sense, that should stir us to righteous anger, not that we lash out at them, but we are trying to stand up for God and for His will. It should stir us to sincere sadness that someone maybe has heard the truth and they have decided to reject it. Because those things certainly moved our Lord to emotion. Think once again about the example of the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. We talked last week, if I remember correctly, about Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. And his heart's desire, his prayer, was for God to provide salvation for his own people, the Jews. And of course God was providing salvation in Christ, but many of them rejected that. But I want us to go back to chapter 9 for just a moment. Here Paul writes at verse 1, beginning, I am telling the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. That there was something when, I'm sure Paul, like Jesus, almost every city he went, he tried to find a synagogue. And he tried to talk to his own people, the Jews first, about Jesus being the Christ. And when many of them decided to reject that message, Paul is saying here, I, I, I was deeply grieved and he was, still was deeply grieved over their lost condition. It wasn't just for him saying, oh well, they've rejected the gospel of Christ. That's on them. And then he goes about his own merry way. No, it cuts him to the heart. <laughs> he is deeply grieved, deeply concerned, because they remain in a lost spiritual state. Think about what the Apostle Paul wrote, the instructions that he gave to those of us who consider ourselves to be spiritual people. In Galatians chapter 6, at verse 1, he says, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted. We need to be like Jesus in this regard. Sometimes when we know the truth and we can see that someone is, uh, has just re rejected the truth or they're not willing to follow the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we tell them the truth, we tell them the truth with this kind of attitude that Paul says here, with gentleness, and yet that can stir this righteous anger within us. That can stir this true sadness over the, the choice that they have made. That we truly love someone enough. If we see them caught in a sin or going the wrong direction, then in a spirit of gentleness we try to correct them. We try to get them back on the right path. What about you as you think about your life? Are you one like Jesus that was moved to emotion and action for people who rejected their Father's will. Then fourthly and finally connected to this as we think about what moved Jesus to emotion, it was doing His Father's will. As we stated earlier, this is exactly why Jesus left heaven and came and lived upon this earth for a time. He came to do His Father's will, to accomplish His Father's will. And to do all of that, of course, for our benefit. And since this was His greatest passion while He was here, it stands to reason that anything associated with accomplishing that particular task, that that produced some emotion, that caused some action in his life. And so what emotions did Jesus express as he went about doing his Father's will here upon earth? I want us to go to the Gospel of John in chapter 2 for just a moment. 
And really this example I think could fit into the prior point that we made about people who rejected the Father's will. But he is here in the temple and he is doing his Father's will. Let's begin reading there at verse 13 of John chapter 2. John says to us that the Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Early on in his earthly ministry, we find from John chapter 2 that Jesus was entering the temple. It was this occasion, but then later on, you might remember in some of the gospel accounts, he once again enters the temple and he finds the same things occurring. But on this occasion, Jesus goes into the temple. He finds there's a lot of business transactions that are taking place, some of which probably were, were sinful. Uh, Mark's account in Mark chapter 11 and verse 17 records the words of Jesus there that you, those who were transacting business in, in the temple, that they had turned the temple into a robber's den. So it's not just that they were doing business that perhaps they shouldn't have been doing, but they were doing business dishonestly that they weren't being honest in their business dealings with one another. And rather than the temple being what God intended for it to be, rather than it being a house of prayer again, as Mark tells us in chapter 11 and verse 17, a house that was devoted to God, the Jews had turned the temple into a place where they could make a big profit, that they could advance their career, they could advance their particular occupation and business. Upon seeing this, it is interesting that John gives us this information here about his disciples remembering something that was written by the prophets long ago, that zeal for your house will consume me. And so upon seeing all of this activity going on in his father's house, Jesus' zeal for the sanctity of his house consumed him to the point that he turned their business literally upside down. And he drove them out of the temple, he drove the animals out of the temple John says, with a scourge of cords. I know there is nothing in this text that says that Jesus, like we looked at there in uh, Mark chapter 3, that Jesus was angry about what was going on. But I don't know how else you could read these words. I don't know how else you could look at this situation and not say at least on some level that Jesus is upset, that he is angered, that his emotions have been touched to the point that he's taking this whip and driving everybody out of the temple. Because the temple was supposed to be a house of prayer. And also as one of the gospel writers records, I think it's Matthew, that it should be a house of prayer for all the nations, for all the Gentiles that those who would truly be God's people, those who would accept God's will for their life, that they too could come and be a part of God's house. His zeal was certainly directed in the right way. He was not out of control again. But his heart was touched. And so he took action. In these next few passages, there are parallel passages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. At the very end of Jesus' earthly life, before he is about to be crucified, we certainly see a very emotional scene for him as he is in the Garden of Gethsemane. First of all, from Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 36. Matthew 26 and verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Over in Mark's account, again, very similar to what we read in the Gospel of Matthew. Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 32. They came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And then Luke's account in Luke chapter 22, 
at verse 44. Luke 22 at verse 44 says that being in agony he, Jesus was praying very fervently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. As his hour was, had finally come, his hour was at hand, Jesus here in these three scenes is pouring out his heart to his Father. And he's doing so, of course, in an intensely emotional way. It's not just the words that are coming from his List, but each of these writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, seem to want to impress upon our minds that this hour touched Jesus' very emotions. He, at this point, felt sorrow, and he felt trouble, and he felt distress like he had never felt before. His emotional suffering was so intense, as Luke tells us here in Luke 22 and verse 44, that as he is fervently talking and communicating and pouring out his heart to his Father, that his sweat is profusely falling to the ground. It was becoming, as it were, like drops of blood. And yet even in this most emotional of all moments, Jesus remained committed to carrying out his Father's will for you and for me, even though he knew that this would be something that would be very painful and something that would be shameful in being crucified to a cross. And aren't we, as we've already remembered this morning, aren't we ever thankful that Jesus did that for each one of us? What about us as we think about our own life, as we think about the will, the commands that God has given us, the kind of people that He wants us to be, the kind of lives lives that He wants us to live? Are we people like Jesus in this regard? Do we have the same zeal? Do we have the same passion that Jesus had for the things of His Father? Not not that we're going out on the street corners and trying to shout people down or call people names or anything like that. But do we have that same kind of zeal and passion and excitement for the things of our Heavenly Father? Do we show zeal for our Father's house, for His church, His own special people, when maybe others show disdain or just an indifference toward the church that belongs to Jesus Christ? Do we overcome our troubled and sorrowful spirits by remaining committed even in those most difficult of times to carrying out our Father's will? In short, does doing our Father's will produce the same kind of passion that it produced in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Technically speaking, yesterday started kind of kicked off the college football season. There were a few games. I didn't get to watch one of those, any of those. I was intending to watch Vanderbilt in Hawaii, but it was on a delay for weather. And uh, somebody told me this morning they finally did get that kicked off and completed. I just didn't want to stay up that late. But really, the college football season begins in earnest this coming Friday. And there's just going to be a whole plethora of games on TV. Maybe even some of you... Maybe going to the Arkansas game here at World Memorial Stadium. I don't know. But if you're living especially in SEC country, maybe in Big Ten country, Jim, <laughs> there, there, there is, it's, it's like nothing else that you can describe, right? I mean, there are people who are fans, and that's short for being fanatics. There are people who are zealous. They are passionate for their team. They're, they're hanging on every play. And they get upset, and I used to be one of those. I'm not as bad as I used to be. But you know, if if there was just a bad play, I mean, I was yelling at the TV. And if we lost a game, I mean, Sunday wouldn't be as good as it could have been or should have been. Thankfully, I've grown a lot in that. But you know, we can show passion for a lot of things. And it's not wrong for us to be passionate about sports. It's not wrong for us to be passionate about our business. It's not wrong for us to be passionate about a lot of good things and blessings and gifts that God has given us in this life. But I'm trying to stress to you this morning that we need to be just as passionate and even more passionate about the things of our God, about our Father's will, and about our Father's house. Because a lot of times those of us who sit down and watch our favorite team play on Saturday, it stirs a lot of emotions in us. And our emotions are all over the place throughout that three or three and a half hours of ball game. 
And then we can assemble sometimes together on Sundays <laughs> with our brethren, and we can sit down during the week and read God's Word, or we can go to God in prayer. And those things may not stir us as they should. To think about that, are we really being like Jesus? As we close our lesson this morning, I would just simply say, as we've thought about these two points today, that if you in your life see and you honestly examine your life and your heart and you see that you're not doing the Father's will, we would urge you to repent. We would urge you to return to Him right now, this very moment. And if you, and we'll do that, if you will make the decision that you want to come and give your life to Jesus Christ or you want to get back on the path that honors our great God and that accomplishes His good will, that He will rejoice with you and all the angels of heaven will rejoice with you. But we here as His children this morning, we will rejoice with you. And you can leave this building knowing that you're right with God. As we're about to sing this song that has been chosen for us to reflect upon, are you resolved to do your Father's will this morning? If you are, won't you act upon that? Won't you come to the front and let your request be made known as we stand and as we sing? Oh God.